Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a uh, adequate weekend at the minimum and are surviving uh, the nature's best attempt to blow the city away. Uh, house of bricks or something like that. Anyways, um, hope uh, I wanted to start out by asking if anybody had any questions about the midterm message that I sent out on, I guess, Friday night. Um, you can tell I had a fantastic Friday night. But... Um, yeah, I sort of converged on what I think is going to work for that. Were there any questions about that that I could address now? You can put them in chat. You can put them in the Discord. You can unmute and ask them. Question came in, what are the questions on Gaia going to be like? I think that you should expect some basic familiarity with what the Gaia mission involved and why the article that we are reading was important. So a lot of the material in the introduction there. Uh, a lot of the usage content of what's going on is going to come on midterm too, because that's kind of after the cutoff. A lot of the stuff we're talking about with stellar populations, the theory of that's there. So I think the things you should focus on are what Gaia is actually doing and how the measurements are generated um, yeah to give us the stuff that we were talking about so the stuff that's sort of reflecting chapter one the actual ob observation stuff uh, other questions well uh, feel free to uh, post them if they come to you, uh, you wake up at 3 a.m. wondering something. But uh, if you don't, that's fantastic. And it means we have over communicated, which is arguably better than under communicating. Uh, OK, I wanted to get started with uh, where we were last time, uh, which was last Wednesday, we talked about star formation and uh, played this sort of fancy video here, which I you know, not going to play again, even though it would be a fantastic way to spend time. It's pretty amazing. Uh, but I want to talk to you about why I kind of took this right turn into star formation uh, at the uh, on Wednesday. And the reason is, is that the star formation process produces something called the initial mass function. And the initial mass function is uh, basically what the star formation process produces. It's a great machine and star formation dumps out stars of all different masses. And the IMF is telling you how many stars of different masses get produced. It's difficult to measure. If we look out and we measure what's called the field star IMF, which is sort of what you see here, uh, or the field star population, which is what you see here captured by uh, Gaia, uh, this mess of stars that you see here is a byproduct of lots and lots of things. Um, you'll notice, if you look up here, the uh, high mass end of this function up here with the O and B stars, that's really devoid. There's like, you know, maybe 20 stars up there at the high mass end inside this Gaia volume. And then there's 65 million of these stars down here. So like how few O stars are there? Well, that's tricky because O stars have a very short lifetime, whereas everything you form at the low mass end of the main sequence has been around since the beginning of the universe. So. Uh, or, well, since it's formed, I would not have aged uh, off the main sequence in the age of the universe. So getting a sense of like what the in actual initial mass function is requires looking at regions of star formation. So these youngest regions of star formation and then measuring the masses of stars there to try to infer what the distribution of stellar masses are that comes out of the star formation machine, these molecular clouds collapsing under gravitation. And uh, the question that you'd really want to face, something that like I, you know, spend research proposals asking is, well, how do the conditions in the star forming medium change the initial mass function? Because you want to understand how the properties of the gas map to the properties of stars. Because this is the mechanism that actually builds up galaxies. And so that's the experiment we want to do. And so this is an example of doing this two different ways. On the 
left hand side we have the mass distributions in star forming regions. These are incredibly famous uh, star forming regions, uh, the, the, the poster children of star forming regions. Uh, if you are studying this in the solar neighborhood, like Taurus and Rho Ophiuchus and IC348, these are all uh, things that I have studied in detail. ONC is the Orion Nebular Cluster. If you look up in the belt of Orion, the sword has the ONC at the end of Orion's sword. Uh, and what you see here is that these all kind of match the same functional form. Then you can do the harder task, which is to look out in regions, these older clusters, like the Pleiades that we've been studying, or Precipi, and try to back out the process of stellar evolution from them. And if you do that, what you see is basically the same functional form. And this leads us to something that's really kind of spooky about star formation physics, is that for all of the train wreck of amazing physics that goes on, this turbulence, magnetic fields, gravitational collapse, these protostellar jets and feedback, all of those seem to combine in the solar neighborhoods so that we're always generating about the same mass distribution of stars. And if we look at this shape, this is a logarithmic scale, we'll get into the shape of this in a bit more detail, ranging in log mass from negative two, that would be 0.01, up to about two, that's a hundred solar masses with the sun right here at zero. And it's a logarithmic scale that drops off pretty sharply. So we see that the star formation process produces a lot of low mass stars and brown dwarfs. You know, the edge of stars is right here and star formation is making a lot of brown dwarfs down at the low mass end. And what we see is when we average these all together, the IMFs appear surprisingly constant in the local neighborhood. And so we've tried to describe this. And so we fit functional forms, not we, people fit functional forms to uh, the initial mass function. And they write down uh, 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 expressions that look like this. dn by dm uh, is equal to a constant times m. And in this case, for what's called the Saul-Peter IMF, uh, that has a power law index of minus 2.35. Uh, when you see this sort of fancy M, that's me non-dimensionalizing the mass uh, to a solar mass. So I say that fancy M is equal to regular M for a star divided by a solar mass. And so I've made that definition here. And that makes things kind of nice. And so the axis that you see down here is fancy M, and so our sun would be right here, sun. That's uh, totally how you write it. High mass stars at the high mass end, low mass stars at the low mass end. Okay, uh, and what's neat is that we actually have multiple functional forms. Saltpeter IMF is one of the earliest attempts. It's uh, over 50 years old that the, Sol uh, the original Saltpeter paper that wrote down this IMF form is uh, over 50 years old. Um, and then there were some revisions to it uh, published by uh, other people whose names are uh, Chabrier and Krupa. Uh, and I write down the actual functional forms for a Chabrier and a Krupa IMF in the book, but we're going to mostly do calculations with the Saltpeter IMF because they're qualitatively similar. They are quantitatively distinct. In particular, pay attention to this low mass end here. That's where the Chabrier and the Krupa IMFs are actually uh, giving us different answers here. So down there at the low mass end, there's a bit of a turnover. And there's this characteristic feature in the initial mass function of stars uh, that seems to be associated with about the gravitational fragmentation scale in a turbulent medium. So it's basically the genes mass, which we derived last time, divided by the Mach number, which is the speed of motions divided by the local speed of sound in a medium. And that kind of gives you that characteristic peak in the initial mass function. So the low mass turnover by the Chabrier and Krupa is happening down here, and the stellar boundary is right here where I've sort of dropped the saltpeter IMF off. And this sort of turnover is telling you how we're making initial, uh, so how we're making brown dwarfs out of this process. So you gotta remember that the initial, the star formation process doesn't just produce stars, it produces 
brown dwarfs, which are the things that range from about uh, 0.0, right, 0 0.02 solar masses up to uh, 0. Uh, zero 08 solar masses uh, in that range. And then things below that, things that are basically 13 Jupiter masses and less massive, are called planets. And the distinction between, and go this into this in the book, the distinction between a brown dwarf and a planet is whether it undergoes lithium fusion. Uh, there's trace amount of lithium, it's really pretty easy to fuse. And so if the object is massive enough to form uh, to fuse that lithium in its formation, uh, then you get a brown dwarf. Below that, it's a planet. And so the question right now, that's the open research question that I, uh, was it? Two weeks ago, I sat in a panel and we read a bunch of uh, proposals and debated the merits of these different research proposals. And one of the proposals was asking, what is the lowest mass object that is made by the initial mass function? Can you make free floating planets from the star formation process, or are all planets formed in disks around stars? It's, a, it's an interesting question, and people are trying to get at that by making observations of the local field population of low mass objects and trying to find free floating planets that were formed separate from the star formation process. So it's kind of a, a hotly debated open topic down here. Whoop. I don't know what I just clicked, but let's not pay attention to that. Oh, dense gas fraction in nearby galaxies. You don't care about that. So what it's doing down here, that is an interesting physics question right now. In addition to why all the IMFs the same. It's kind of weird as to how that comes out. All right. So I'm going to pre-apologize. I'm going to yammer at you for a little bit and then uh, get you to have some equal questions. If you have any questions, just please throw them into chat. You don't have to pause and wait for me to... Uh, you know, come up with uh, anything to say. But uh, I did want to say that uh, I wanted, did want to work through a couple examples. Your homework for, which is posted now and due after the midterm, so basically two weeks-ish uh, from now, a little less, uh, involves a lot of calculations with the IMF and demonstrating the power by which the initial mass function sort of gives us about understanding stellar populations. And so I want to give you a couple examples of how to work with this expression. Uh, this is an example question, which is, for a Salpeter IMF, what fraction of stars have a mass greater than 10 solar masses? And for simplicity, I'm just going to take stellar masses from running from 0.1 up to 100, just to make the math easier. You can put any bounds on this but uh, this makes my numbers a little bit easier. And so the real question here is, what is the meaning of an expression that's dn by dm? And dn is basically, that's a number. It's how many number of uh, stars there are per unit mass interval. So this weird differential form is really indicating that this is a probability density function. And something we should have learned, uh, we are learning a sort of running gag throughout the entire uh, class is that probability density functions are meant to be integrated. And so what we're going to do is a little integration. So if we want to answer this question uh, of what are the high mass stars, we can say that F, I'll just call that, uh, I don't know, we'll just call it F for the sake of that. That is basically the number of stars between 10 and 100 solar masses for a stellar population. And so what we do is we have to integrate from 10 to 100 solar masses of the number of stars. And that's the notation that I'll use as we add up kind of the differential number that's changing as a function of mass. And then I want to compare that differential number to 0 0.1 to 100, which is all the possible stars. And so this, uh, let me annotate this, which is, this is the number of stars with mass m greater than 10, and this is number of stars with all possible masses. And then I'm going to do one step further and sort of unpack this uh, a bit, which is, uh, F is going to rewrite, I'll write that dn in the top as 10 to 100 of dn by dm integrated, oops, that's fancy m's, integrated over mass. And then this is integral from 0 0.1 
to 100 of dn by dm over dm. And so then we can substitute in this functional form here for the dn by dm. And if I was saying use Krupp IMF or use a Chabri IMF, you would change that functional form. But the reason we use saltpeter is I can do the calculus and without you know having to remember uh, something that happened to be uh, decades ago. So what we can do is stick this in here and uh, we say, okay, so this is the integral from 10 to 100 of C star times fancy M to the minus 2.35 D fancy M over the integral from 0 0.1 to 100 C star M to the minus 2.35 DM. So these are the same integral, just with different bounds. And this C star here, let's get a little annotation going on here. This is a constant that depends on the population you're considering. So this depends on total number, oops, total number or mass of stars. But the way we've set this up, and I asked about a fraction, that's great, because we just cancel it. So that's a constant, and it cancels away. Uh, on your homework, we'll sort of give you some examples where you do have to care about the constant, but for here, uh, all you have to do is, you know, just cancel it out because it's set up as a fraction, and then we carry out this integral. Uh, so without further ado, I can see that this is minus 1 over 1.35, fancy m evaluated from 10 to 100, divided by negative 1 over 1.35, fancy m from 0.1 to 100. Now, it's not critical to do this, but something I like to do when I have these uh, cases is I like to take this negative sign out front and switch the bounds of integration because that makes it so that it's a little clearer what's happening to me. I don't know if it necessarily does for you, but we end up with 1 over 1.35, uh, 10 to the uh, negative 1.35 minus 100 to the negative 1.35 all over 1 over 1.35, same thing, 0 0.1 minus 1.35 minus 100 to the minus 1.35. And I should note that these are in big square brackets. To group those up together, cancel that out. And if I put this in here, the reason why I like to switch those bounds of integration is that a number like... Uh, 10 to the minus 1.35 is going to be larger than 100 to the minus 1.35 because of the inverse power. And so that gives me a positive answer when I carry out these integrals. And so if you end up with like negative numbers running around, uh, negative numbers of stars, it, it confuses me. I am easily distracted and confused. Uh, but you calculate out these numbers and you get 0 0.0019. And let's reflect on what that means. This is basically two stars in a thousand are larger than 10 solar masses. When I make stars, uh, only you know, if I make a thousand stars by number, only two of them are going to be this massive. So that's basically only two stars are going to have supernova explosions. The threshold is nine instead of 10, you know, but there it's you know, roughly equal there. So it's, you know, it, this is the power of the IMF. It allows us to really understand the full population of stars and compare them. So you have to remember, when we're looking at stars, almost all the stars are these low mass red dwarfs that are just kind of hanging around and doing nothing for their lives. They're just, well, I mean, they're fusing hydrogen. I can't do that. I mean, why should I throw some shade? Because it's, anyways, um, so, but, you know, they don't do much exciting in terms of astrophysics. They make a little red starlight, and that's about it. They hang out and are mass. Good job. I'm a mass, too. Any questions on how the calculations there fell out? I'm only looking at lecture questions. Anything else pop up? Nope. Oh, yep. There is power on top of fancy M, right? Uh, oh, yes. Sorry. I did sort of elide that. That's minus 1.35. Let me rewrite this mess because otherwise it'll be... Uh, 
I did drop the power right here in my haste to get on to a conclusion. Minus 1.35, evaluated from 10 to 100. Minus 1.35, evaluated 10, oh, oh, 0.1 to 100. Yeah, so that's where this power came from. Thank you for correcting me. All right, now I promised a lot of yammering and I'm gonna fulfill that because I want to do another example. Because this is a kind of question that we run into a bit, which is what is the average property of a star averaged over the population of stars? So this is asking, what's the average main sequence lifetime of stars between two and 10 solar masses? It's kind of cool that this is the kind of stuff that we begin to be able to ask. Uh, and we already have an expression for the main sequence lifetime. I'm going to use that the main sequence lifetime of a star is tau sun, which is 10 billion years. We'll just stick that in there. Fancy m to the minus 2.5. And that was something we derived in chapter two uh, from the mass and luminosity relationship for stars. But this allows us to ask, you know, if I make a bunch of stars and I'm looking at the stars between two and 10 solar masses, on average, counted by number of stars, how long will those stars live? You know, if I make, you know, it, 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 basically at what point are half of the stars going to be gone? And so that's what's going to give me uh, this piece here. And this is restricting me to a specific mass range. So whenever we see a functional, uh, an average like this over a distribution, we have to remember a, uh, how, what this really means in terms of calculus, which is basically if I was doing a number like a weighted average, like grades or something like that, um, I'll note that like if I was calculating, I use these angle brackets to indicate an average value. So average value of property Y. If I was going to do a discrete average, you would add up the number of objects N with a you know property uh, or number of objects with property Y uh, is N and we would add that up and then we divide by the total number. Ah, my sigma has failed over the total number. So if you had three stars with, you know, y equals one and five stars with y equals two, you do three times y, three times y of one, so three times one, plus five times two, and then you would divide that by the total number of stars, which would be three plus five. So this is this kind of calculation where the weights in my weighted average are just the numbers with each different property. The initial mass function is telling us how do you weight these averages uh, in terms of uh, the stellar mass as the property? And then we have this property that's specified in terms of the stellar mass. So what we're going to do is use not just a discrete average, but we're going to use an integral average. So what we would have if we're going to do an integration uh, average, we would pass basically from discrete numbers of uh, values, uh, discrete, uh, discrete values with discrete numbers into a continuum of numbers. And so we would say that there's y times the number, differential number, over this differential number, which is basically the PDF, the probability density function, over whatever range we consider. So this is the sort of fancy version of how to calculate an average with this integral average. So you could basically the average value of the function y weighted by this PDF. And so what we're going to do for this is to actually carry out this uh, integral. So uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's stick this. Let's start up here because I feel like I'm going to need some space. So the average value of the lifetime, tau, is going to be the integral, and we're integrating from 2 to 10, 2 solar masses up to 10 solar masses, of the lifetime, tau main sequence, times dn by dm, fancy m, times d fancy m. Then we're going to divide that by the total number of stars in that integral. 
interval, sorry, two to 10 of dn by d fed cm times d fed cm. Uh, and so this is uh, basically the function weighted by the number of stars at that mass, and the bottom is the total number of stars. So it's just an average, but using integrals instead of just straight sums. Okay, so given this math, we'll uh, head on over here to the place where we have space, and we will stick in that the average value of tau is equal to the integral from 2 to 10 of tau sun, that's the constant in the main sequence, in the mass, in the main sequence lifetime relation, uh, tau sun times fancy m to the minus 2.5 times dn by dm, which is c star times fancy m to the minus 2.35 uh, times d fancy m. And then we will divide that by the same thing without the main sequence lifetime part. So we don't include this, just the tail end of the top integral. So c star times fancy m to the minus 2.35 times d fancy m. And so with these pieces, what we can do is do some canceling. Goodbye. It's been nice knowing you, c star. You're not relevant today. And then we can pull out this tau sun. So that's nice. Oops, go back to red. Uh, we can pull out the tau sun. That's nice because it'll give us an answer in terms of a solar lifetime. So it's some fraction of a solar lifetime or multiple of it. I have hope. I shouldn't have hope. These are high mass stars. Um, and then I can combine some powers here. So minus 2 to 10, uh, 2.5. Uh, negative 2.5 minus 2.35 is fancy m to the minus 4.85 d fancy m over integral 2 to 10 m to the minus 2.35 dm. So this, at this point, it's just, just an integral. I'll uh, crack it out real quick. Tau sun, uh, 1 over 3.8. Five, uh, fancy m. Oops, sorry. Let's go straight to constants. Mm, let's not. Uh, there's, there's no, no hurry. Well, there is a hurry. We have a very short amount of contact hours. Uh, One point three five, fancy m two to ten, and I have absorbed the negative sign into flipping the bounds of integration. So this is tau sun times 1.35 over 2.85, 3, 3.85, 3.85 times uh, 2 to the 3 point, I did it again, 3, uh, my imagine son of a crap. I just love to get to substitution so bad. Uh, minus 3.85, uh, 2 to 10, and then the bottom here should have the power of minus 1.35. Fancy m to the minus 1.35 uh, from 10 to 2. And then so it's 2 to the minus 3.85 minus 10 to the minus 3.85 over 2 to the minus 1.35 minus 10 to the minus 1.35. So this is a bunch of calculations. Sticking all of these, they always have the same structure, which kind of looks like this. If you're like, I've, I've seen this before, it's a good reason. We'll take tau sun here to be 10 gig years. And we go through all that, and we get an answer out that's about 7 times 10 to the 8th years. Which, you know, that's you know a little bit shorter, but not a lot shorter. So this is, uh, you know, 700 mega years. Okay, so given all those pieces uh, sort of flowed through, any questions on how that went? Please. Right, so the, yeah. So the numerator is taking in, it basically has two parts. The first, it's a weighted, you know, I think about it as the weighted average, where you have one part is the number of stars. And it's the number of stars. And the only way we can express the number of stars is per unit mass interval. 
So this first term is the number of stars. This is n at a given m. And then this second part here is the is tau for that m. And that corresponds to the y value here. It's the value you're calculating an average over. I want the average of this quantity, so I need to know what the number is at that quantity, and that's encompassed in the initial mass function. Finally, the bottom, just for completeness, uh, this is just, oop, the whole thing is the total number of stars. All right, no problem. Other questions? All right, that was a lot of calculation uh, for this. I wanted to go through two examples. It sets you up for your homework a bit, and it also illustrates the power of the IMF. The fact that we have an IMF, that there is one thing that you can sort of say, this is the initial mass function, at least for our part of the galaxy, is a very powerful tool because it's what allows us to uh, calculate the average properties of galaxies as a whole knowing how quickly they form stars so that we can just average everything over the initial mass function, which is basically the number of stars at a given mass. And if you know the mass of star and to a lesser degree its metallicity, you know everything that it does. So it's kind of cool. We make some stars. We know we, we make a certain amount of gas into stars. The IMF tells us how that the masses of stars are distributed. Stellar evolution tells us how those stars behave. And we predict the behavior of galaxies over gig years, which is phenomenal. Um, yeah, so I didn't actually put it into the notes here, but the book does raise a few points that the IMF is not necessarily 100% constant across all space and time. And we do see situations where there's evidence that the IMF varies uh, in very old relic galaxies. It looks like they had more low mass stars than expected. And then it looks, if you look at uh, dwarf galaxies uh, that are just forming a lot of stars right now in these things that are called starbursts, it seems like they have an excess of high mass stars. And those aren't necessarily exclusive. You can have a population with both low, more low mass and more high mass stars. Uh, but there's two cases at least where we think that the IMF breaks down. But for our galaxy over the recent past in our sort of local neighborhood, it seems that this Saltpeter or the Krupa Charbier IMFs are pretty good descriptions of the stars that we see. Okay. So that's one piece in our toolkit to start to understand stellar populations. And we mentioned this a bit on Friday, that a simple stellar population is a population of stars that form uh, at the same time from gas with the same metallicity. It's key to understand that the stars in SSPs have different masses. And so that means that they are have the same start time, they have the same starting conditions, but they go through their lives very differently. And so we've been talking on about this uh, cluster here, Precipi, a lot. Uh, that's what Pres I figured I should drag up a picture of Precipi here so you could actually see what it uh, looks like. But, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, the beehive for reasons that I'm not entirely clear on. Uh, and the reason why uh, we care so much about this is that stellar clusters are the classic canonical example of a simple stellar population. And we think that stellar clusters form in one of these big star formation events uh, that we saw back here, where we saw it all clashes together and there's all these stars sort of coming together. It comes out of a bound part 
of the uh, molecular cloud that underwent star formation. It's all kind of held together by the gas. It forms these stars all together in one kind of big star formation event and then releases the stars out into space. So clusters appear to form from gas that was initially gravitationally bound to itself. Not necessarily going to remain that way, but it starts out that way. All right. Um, are these slides still on the lecture PDF Stellar Pop 5? Uh, I have not updated these because of chaos. I'm sorry. Uh, let me, I'm, I can chuck that. Oh, what did I just do? Abort, abort, abort. Cancel. I don't hit that button in the middle of class. Uh, yeah, let me throw my PDF up here real quick in case you're following along. This is a fast update. I just forgot to do it. All right, yeah, so that goes into here. Yeah, I threw up uh, Stellar Pops 05A, which has the rest of the slides that I worked on over the weekend. And save and return to course. We're good. All right. Yeah, so if you're annotating PDFs, there's a fresh, hot PDF for you to enjoy right now. Mm. Getting hungry. Okay. Uh, so simple stellar populations, the reason why we care about or we can start to analyze stellar populations is to use this use of isochrons. And we dealt with isochrons ad nauseum on Friday and our start you'll get a chance to work with isochrones on homework uh, for uh, for you know the actual Gaia data but uh, in you know detail we sort of covered that stars in the sim in simple stellar populations fall along these isochrones which is the uh, which is defined to be the stars with the same age uh, same metallicity different masses and they've all evolved very quickly uh, at the high mass end and haven't evolved much at all at the low mass end. So the, uh, you know, here's Precipi and it's a uh, stellar isochrone here. Uh, we mentioned that there's this binary sequence that we saw. We saw white dwarfs, we saw red giants up here, and we saw the main sequence turnoff, which is the point at which it transitions from fusing hydrogen into helium in its core uh, to the red giant phase for a low mass star like this. We have a metallicity. So the isochrones kind of give us this relationship here of where to find stars in the HR diagram. And so, uh, given what we had talked about on Friday here, I think I'll finally shut up for the day and ask you, uh, which of these star clusters is the youngest? I switched from oldest to youngest here because uh, it's hard to tell the oldest from the second oldest, but the youngest is a little clear. Uh, in case you missed the pre-roll, uh, the ePoll code is L-U-W. Yes. Yeah, I don't know how to make the option E go away. All right, when you're looking to answer a question like this, usually what you're going for is the stars at the main sequence turnoff point, and you don't necessarily see the main sequence turnoff point in a uh, isochrone early on, but later on you can start to see that these little, uh, these little hooks here, 
uh, uh, feature this. But the key thing that I always uh, go in, uh, look at in detail is the absolute magnitude or luminosity of the brightest star that's kind of in the upper left corner of the isochrone. So up here like this, and you sort of would say, okay, this is the region up here. That's at about zero. That's uh, also around zero. That's maybe a little above zero here. This one goes up to minus three. Uh, and so the stars up there at the very high luminosity level, those are the ones that are the brightest stars and will also be the ones that will evolve off the main sequence the fastest. So this cluster A has these real high luminosity stars that are still in its isochrone, even you know if you don't have too many of them there, uh, the fitting isochrone kind of takes it up uh, that way. Uh, and so here, the answer is going to be A uh, for the isochrone fitting, based on the isochrone fitting. So how do we get O? Oop. We like A. C's, yeah, it's not a terrible answer. Um, because they basically, if you're looking at the stars, this is a little more ambiguous, uh, just because all the stars kind of come up to about zero here. Uh, and you can't really, you know, there's not many cluster stars here, uh, but the isochrone is what I was cluing in on. All right, let's hop back to me. Okay. Uh, so went over uh, this briefly on Friday. Uh, I will go over it briefly a second time and that makes it going over it in detail, right? Right, yeah, sure. Um, the figure here that I had generated was I sort of went in and I used these stellar models that we were using in chapter two, and I generated a suite of isochrones of different ages for a population of stars with solar metallicity. Uh, the high mass stars evolve faster, uh, and what's neat about this is that they evolve faster onto the main sequence, so their protostellar phase is shorter, as well as off of the main sequence. And so if you look down here, stars, this is log age of about a million years. So 10 to the 6 is about a million years. And you see these isochrones here uh, down at the low mass end, they haven't even made it to the main sequence yet. You start the stars off and the th low mass stars are still contracting onto the main sequence. They're going through their protostellar evolution, but the high mass stars up here, they're off. They fuse hydrogen, they're getting ready to go supernova. And in fact, supernova often disrupt regions of star formation because the duration of star formation and the uh, large, the shortest main sequence lifetime are about the same. They're both about 3 million years. And so supernova explosions often go off in regions of star formation. And it's one of the reasons why star formation stops. We talked about, uh, a, yeah, we talked about the efficiency of the star formation process. And one of the reasons why the efficiency of the star formation process is fairly low is uh, all of these explosions and stellar winds going off in the environment. The main sequence turnoff is marked here with these little uh, circles in every case. And so you can sort of see that there's this thick region, uh, here I'll highlight it in A color, uh, right here, that sort of spans where you expect to find stars that are on the main sequence at some point. Because of this feature of main sequence evolution uh, from you know, loss of particle number in the core leading to the star having to fuse a little hotter and brighter to maintain pressure support, you get a thick main sequence if the stars are all uh, of different ages. But for a population, a simple stellar population on an isochrome, they all end up on a very narrow uh, band. And we saw that in our cluster studies with Gaia, but if we look at the field population, that sort of red and white uh, diagram, you see that the main sequence is pretty thick. And the dominant contributor to that is the fact that stars have different ages. That's a good multiple choice question. I wouldn't ask you about that on this term. term. This is after the midterm cup. That's important to note. Okay, so here's that uh, thick um, main sequence uh, here in uh, uh, Gaia data. This main sequence, it's 
it's it, it's a chunky main sequence, unlike the sort of thin uh, main sequences here in uh, the the clusters, the invisible and the isochrones. And that comes from the fact that they all have these different ages uh, and are evolving off of the main sequence uh, through uh, different effects. But also, uh, we see that these isochrones have a little bit of thickness because of different, or sorry, these main sequences has a bit of thickness because of different metallicities uh, shift stuff around. So the, um, yeah, let's take that away here. Uh, so the thing that I've done is shifting from this uh, view of isochrones back to this view of isochrones is that I've mapped things into the Gaia pass bands. And I haven't done this. I just used the hard work of the MIST group at Harvard and I downloaded their isochrones that have been put into the Gaia photometry system. So what happens here is the Gaia photometry system uh, is now putting the values that we're used to seeing, this GPRP on uh, the, the blue minus red on the y-axis and Gaia absolute magnitude on the, this is the y-axis, this is the x-axis. Yeah, put the, the variables we're used to. So these ice crumbs now match up with the observational data that we've been collecting. And so that shows up here. And you can see that there's this big hook over here to the red in the red giants at about minus 2.5. And sure enough, up here, big hook over into the red giants at about minus 2.5. Main sequence running down here, to 10 and two, you know, so it's two on the color index, 10 on the absolute magnitude, two on the color index, 10 on the absolute magnitude. Yeah. Things are, things are looking pretty reasonable for uh, these isochrone models. Um, and so we actually able to do the fitting in the observational space. I want to just sort of pause and reflect back on something else we talked about, because we discussed uh, on Wednesday how stellar populations can be unresolved as well. And we measure the spectra of many, many stars uh, in the observation. So we can do the same exercise where we make a bunch of stars and then we sort of average up their, uh, average up their light over time and accept instead of sort of doing this in just these coarse Gaia pass bands for a bunch of individual stars, we can also change the nature of the measurement and do a bunch of stars at, uh, all at once for a bunch of different wavelengths. And that will give us a spectrum. And so we can also kick out the spectrum of the stars. And these are measured in weird units. These are called mass per unit, uh, or light per unit mass. And so this is something you use in galaxy evolution models where you figure out, oh, we've made this much mass of stars. You can multiply it by this factor, luminosity over mass, uh, to get, turn it into a spectrum. Uh, this looks like a Y, but it's actually an upsilon. Um, this is a classic variable for a uh, light, uh, light to mass ratio. Anyways, uh, what the too long didn't read is what you can see here is with these spectra is they start out very young, 10 million years here, and they're very blue. Uh, up to this 91.2 nanometers, which is the ionization energy for hydrogen. And once you do that stellar atmosphere, you get up above that ionization energy for hydrogen, that 13.6 eV, the spectra from stars changes appreciably. And so uh, it acts as a big source of opacity and puts a big cutoff in there. But anyways, what you can see is that this is a very bright, so it's high amplitude, blue, it peaks up here in the ultraviolet and the blue. And then over time, that spectrum kind of fades away and gets redder. So you'll notice it sort of falls down. And then the red component of the spectrum out here becomes more dominant at a 10 billion year old population. You can see this very clearly in some uh, surveys, uh, survey bands. So we haven't worked much with the Sloan bands yet, but these are the Sloan Digital Sky Survey bands, UGRIS. Uh, and there's a lot of famous diagrams that we'll see later in the course that involve the G minus R color here. And that uh, color is going to grow with age. Remember, larger values of color, G minus R color, means more R relative to G. Uh, so it gets, starts out here in this 10 million year population where there's more green 
G band rather than R band light. So that would be a negative value of the color index. And then it balances out and eventually sort of switches uh, direction uh, here to get, uh, once you get up to 10 billion years. And so this G minus R color gives you a diagnostic of how young the stellar population is. But remember, that the stellar population that you see is the things that are emitting the most light, not necessarily the stuff that has the most mass, because these young stars, look how much light this is. They're getting up to like 10 to the zero. An old population is down here and it's 10,000 times fainter. You can have the same amount of mass in a 10 mega year population and a 10 gig year population, uh, but the 10 mega year population will be 10,000 times brighter. And you'll look at a galaxy and say, it's all young stars, but that's just because the young stars dominate the light of the system. Okay, so I think that's a brilliant breaking point here uh, because the next thing we want to talk about is what factors go into making a real stellar population, a non-simple stellar population. And we have to deal with a variety of different effects that can finally use the IMF and those effects to explain this diagram that you see here. All right, see you all on Wednesday when we will get non-ideal. Thanks everybody and have a good uh, 48 hours. Bye-bye. Go ahead.